Welcome to today's COVID-19 update. We're speaking with the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. Minister Anthony, again, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me yes, on the sir. program. Well, I wanted to start today um, with a general update on the vaccination campaign. How is that going? And then I'll just quickly add on. So we know that Region 9 has completed its vac vaccination of uh, its health care, frontline health care workers. What about the other regions? I think we're making progress with uh, health care workers. Um, by and large, in most of the regions, uh, health care workers have been taking their vaccines, which is a good thing. Uh, the only problematic, I would say problematic area is in Region 10, and that is uh, there are still quite a number of healthcare workers there that haven't taken their vaccines, but I, I suppose they should take you from the other regions, and I think Region 9 is a good example because we have been able to achieve 100% of healthcare workers being immunized. Some of the other regions are at uh, 70 and 80% and so forth. But I expect as, as we roll out more and more vaccines, uh, people would be getting their shots. So I think that's important. Uh, over the last uh, 24 hours or so, uh, the number of persons being vaccinated has risen. So we now are about uh, 36,000 uh, um, persons being uh, immunized uh, at least with, with their first shots. Um, some people already have started getting their second shot because those who have received the Sinopharm uh, vaccine have been coming back now for their second shot. So while we are giving first doses to a lot of people, we are now uh, being able to uh, start doing the second dose uh, for persons with Sinopharm and that would continue. So those persons who would have received both doses of the Sinopharm would now be fully immunized. All right, Minister, we had spoken about this earlier and you had indicated that no one would be forced to take the vaccine. Uh, have the nurses in Region 10 indicated uh, any particular reason as to why there is a stand, just for clarity? Well, it's not only nurses, it's other categories of health staff. Um, we don't have any particular reason, but I suppose as more and more people take their vaccines, um, they too would, would start getting theirs. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, given that the vaccination campaign has uh, expanded, are there increased uh, monitoring as well? Yes, we, we are um, at each of the, the sites that we have, as you know, uh, after you're vaccinated, you spend 15 minutes for us to monitor you. And then subsequently, uh, you will get a call uh, to see whether or not you have developed any signs or symptoms. So we have been monitoring and uh, we have a team that has been put together to make sure that we track whatever signs and symptoms people are having. All right. And I know another major activity, aside from us, uh, our initial preparation for the COVAX vaccine that should be rolled out from uh, this week, uh, we're expecting the Russian Sputnik as well. Yeah. So COVAX, we have already started utilizing those vaccines. Uh, there, uh, we received uh, 24,000 of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which we have familiarity with because uh, the donation that we received from India was also AstraZeneca vaccine. So our staff is already acquainted with that vaccine. So we have started rolling that out. Um, in addition to the, the AstraZeneca that we now receive from COVAX, uh, we are expecting the Sputnik vaccine. This is a different vaccine um, and therefore while we have theoretically trained our staff, uh, when we actually get the vaccine, we'll have to go through some uh, special training with them so that they can use it um, properly. And that, that, would be, um, that would be done as soon as we receive those vaccines. All right, sir. Thank you so much. I wanted to briefly talk about the dashboard. A lot of people are alarmed that the numbers are increasing, and obviously we've spoken about it. We know the why those numbers are going up. There is no camouflage of it. Persons are flouting the measures and so on. So I wanted to speak to you um, in particular 
uh, about the penalty and and basically if we can talk about if you can remind us about uh, the penalty for breaching the measures well, if you don't wear a mask um, and the police arrest you, you will be fined. Uh, there's a specific fine that is in the order um, that the magistrates can use. They can also impose other penalties on you. So mask wearing is essential. If businesses breach uh, the COVID orders, uh, there are a set of measures there as well that can be used. And, and I think the magistrates have been doing that. So a lot of people have been charged so far with breaching these orders um, and we are going to continue to do that. In fact, uh, from the last task force, we are going to step up the enforcement because we are seeing uh, people, re you know, not paying heed uh, to the warnings that we have put out. And if they don't, then we'll see a rise in cases. Uh, today, you would actually see that over the last 24 hours, we have had 126 positive cases. Most of those are coming from Region 4, and, um, you know, we just have to get people to comply. Of those cases, there's a sizable, uh, well, there's a, a number of persons who are already in the hospital. We have right now 52 persons in hospital. So this is, this is a serious thing. So while we're doing vaccination, and that is going to certainly help, people still have to abide by the, um, the rules that we have out there or you're going to get infected. And a percentage of persons are going to end up in the hospital. And a percentage of those in the hospital are going to die. So this thing is not, uh, you know, it's not a joke. It's not a hoax. People are dying because of this disease. And unless we take precautions, we are going to see the consequences of our action. So I'm really appealing to people because we are seeing that over the last couple of days, we have seen increases. And this is not only in Guyana. Globally, um, there have been a resurgence of COVID cases. In the Americas, over the last week or so, PAHO WHO has shown that Throughout the Americas, there have been an increase in about 11% more of the cases from the previous week. Uh, so we are seeing increases, and therefore we have to take precautions. We have to, or else uh, if, if we continue at this rate, our health systems can be overwhelmed. So people need to start paying serious attention. I know we have a holiday weekend coming up where it's traditional for people to go out and, 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 and to have um, all these interaction and they will be in crowd and people like to go on the seawall and, and fly kites and all those things are prohibited because the mass gathering that people want to do, you are not in the normal time. You're in a pandemic and a pandemic really means that you have to change your behavior. Right, so I, um, the police and the army would be uh, enforcing some of these measures in a stricter way. And I hope that people can understand and comply because what they're doing is to the, for the protection of all of us. And if we, if we can understand that and avoid going out and getting in, in, in these large crowds, uh, that would certainly help us. So if you don't have to go out, stay home. Enjoy the holiday at home. Yes, sir. All right, I have some questions here from two media houses. We have the Village Voice uh, News. They've been doing an investigative piece, and some of the questions from that, they're asking, it is likely that the Ministry of Health is aware that some business owners are evading the COVID-19 measures in place, and as Minister of Health and a member of the NCTF, are additional efforts being discussed to prevent such flouting of the regulations in place? And you just you just addressed that. So I'll go to the second, which says, what measures would you give to business owners engaging in such practices, and what can the general public do to help? Well, it's simple. If people know that um, there are businesses that are evading these measures, 
they should report them to the police so that the police can take action. There's another category of people um, that we understand that they're um, advertising house parties where people gather in the homes and, and, and those kinds of things. If, if we get that information, the police would also act on those information because it's, it's, it's crazy. In a pandemic, you want to, to bring all kinds of people into your home to have a party. Is that so important? At this stage in, in, in the pandemic, is having a party more important than protecting people's health? So, you know, I sometimes marvel at um, the people who are doing this because it, it's obvious to me that they don't understand the, the, the conditions in which we are living right now. We are living in a pandemic and therefore all these actions would have implications on the transmission of this disease, the outcome of what is going to happen, hospitalization, deaths and so forth and they are contributing they are contributing they're catalyzing the transmission of this disease by having these house parties and trying to evade uh, things and the, the persons who are going there you're not you're not among friends if your friend is inviting you to a house party where you'll have all kinds of other people what your friend is actually doing is con is endangering your life and all the other persons that are there so at some point, I don't know at what point, this message would sink into people. It is about your individual responsibility. You have to. You have to understand and take measures to protect yourself. So if people have information on these things, they should report it to the police so that the police can take action. And as you would have not, uh, noticed over the last couple of weeks, some of these businesses that have uh, not been complying, the police have gone in, uh, arrested people, uh, charged them, taken them before the court and things like that. And that's going to continue. Yes, sir. All right, the next question they have, they're asking, uh, it has also been observed that while the police presence in heavy is heavy in some areas of Georgetown, it is not heavy in other areas where some scores of persons gather openly on the street and what can be done to ensure equity of that or that the police are targeting the right night spots? The first thing got to be with the first level got to be with people understanding that you shouldn't be doing this and avoid doing it. And then the second level is that businesses got to be more responsible. Then when all of these fail, then we should go to the police for the enforcement. So you have different tiers that we have to operate on. Um, but nevertheless, if, again, if people know that their gatherings, their parties, their businesses that accept people and, and lock them in the business uh, so that they can party whole night, if we know of those things, they should be reported so that the police and other agencies can take the relevant action. Right, sir. Uh, my last set of questions come from Kaichur News. They're asking, can you confirm if it's true that several doctors resigned from the West Demerara Hospital on Tuesday? And if that is so, what was the reason for their resignation? Well, it seems like the, uh, the tail is wagging the dog because I understand from, uh, at a press conference that Mr. Harmon had that he made such statements. Um, earlier, there was a post from uh, Mahi Paul, um, one of the members of the APNU, uh, talking about that. I have asked the uh, authorities at the West Demerara Hospital whether or not they have received any such resignation. I'm told that about three weeks ago, one doctor had resigned. Uh, as of today, we haven't received any resignation from any doctor. So whatever it is at this point in time, we haven't seen those resignation. And maybe Mr. Mahi Paul is uh, wagging, wagging the, the, the leader of the opposition to make these statements. So I don't, I, I, we haven't seen any. And therefore, um, what I know is that in the last three weeks, uh, there was one person who resigned. 
I don't know how one can become several. All right, the next question they're asking, can you also confirm if doctors are faced with double workload? And they're asking if they're, they're working at the A&E and they're also working the wards simultaneously. And just as a follow-up quickly, lastly, is it true that there are shortages of drugs and medication for patients at that institution? So I'm not sure what, uh, what is called double workload. Doctors are employed by the institution. They have uh, fixed times when they work. So whether you're getting in from 8 to 4.30, you're supposed to be in the hospital during that time. Um, then you have on call, which means that if you're working in a particular department, you require uh, to, to be on call for the night and there's a rotation when, whether it's one in three, one in four, one in five, whatever it is, their rotation. So every uh, three nights you will be um, on call or every four nights or whatever it is. Those things are standard practices in medicine. So there's nothing about double and triple and whatever. This is standard practice. If you're working in a particular department, um, let's say you're working in medicine, the medicine department, then you do your rounds, you see your patients, and you're also responsible for doing uh, outpatient clinics. If you're working in the surgical department, you have to do your rounds and similarly and that there are some doctors from these departments who would be assigned uh, to work in the accident and emergency department as well. So this is quite normal practice, and this is not something that we have invented. It has been there for many, many years. When I practiced as a clinician, I don't know, many, many years ago at the Georgetown Hospital, this was a system that we had in place. And today, pretty much that system still exists. So I don't know what, what is being insinuated here, but we employ people and we want them to spend their time in the hospital to see patients. What I can say is that we have a number of doctors who have been employed with us who would come in, they spend maybe an hour in the hospital and then they run away to their private practice. This is something that we are working to curb because they're not serving the population in the public health system for which they are being paid. And if trying to correct that is making some people uneasy, and if it's making the opposition uneasy, well then I'm happy to make them uneasy because these doctors must first of all be there and serve the patients of the public institution. And I don't make any apologies for that. Yes sir, and they, just to follow up, they, they're asking if there are uh I think this one, yes. Is it true that there are shortages of drugs and medication for patients at the institutions? I'm thinking they're asking West Demerara, but we have spoken about this. But again, last week we had a press conference where I detailed the shortages that we have, the steps that we are uh, taking to remedy those shortages, uh, because we inherited a mess from the APNU AFC. One, they, um, they had a whole set of expired drugs that were in the bond. You, we had to dump close to 10 billion Ghana dollars worth of expired drugs. And again, I note that the, the leader of the opposition is saying that what, that was there from since 2013. Now, that's interesting because if it's there from 2013, it means that you have kept this thing for more than five years of the APNU term in the bond and instead of you you know clearing the expired thing because you can't use them instead of clearing that out making space for proper drugs you have kept it in there and filled the bond up with expired drugs and then you went and you rent sussex street bond what nonsense is that and spend millions of dollars on sussex street that doesn't make sense at all the, but what we know and what the evidence would show is that in 2017, the, the Ministry uh, of Public Health bought uh, three sets of drugs, the same thing. And they made three orders of the same thing, which resulted in these medicines not being able to, the, the, the different health centers were not able to consume the medicines because they, they bought 
three times the amount that was necessary. And because of that, that's why the things have expired. And we have all the evidence. We have all the evidence to say that. So he's being disingenuous when he was saying that all the expired drugs was before they took office. The expired drugs happened after they took office and started uh, around 2017 when they bought three times the amount that was necessary. And after that, they did not buy drugs. So it's, uh, you know, the evidence is there. The staff who has been uh, going through these things have said to us all that happened. And we'll, we'll be able to produce that evidence. What I want him to do is to show us the evidence that from the expired drugs from 20, that was before 2015, let him bring the evidence to show that. Because I have evidence to show that the drugs that were bought, uh, when it was bought, and how much of it expired because they, they had surplus and the, the system was not able to consume it. So when they, when they want to cast aspiration and blame, it is what it is that they mismanaged the health system, that they were not able to procure properly, and that many of the things that they procure were not what the doctors were using. And to compound that problem, you had all these expired drugs piling up in the MMU. And instead of getting rid of it so that you can create space and properly store the drugs, they went and ha had a bottom house where they were storing the, the medicines improperly. So, you know, we, we, we can talk about this and we are ready for a debate anytime they're ready because we have all the facts and we can lay that out at any time. Yes, sir. Minister Anthony, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Well, thank you very much for having me on the program. Yes, sir. Well, that's it for today's COVID-19 update. We just spoke with the Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. Remember, for more information, you can log on to our website, dpi.gov.gy, and the Ministry of Health's website as well, health.gov.gy, and, of course, our social media platforms.